Well, good, good evening, everyone. Um, I thought it'd be helpful for me because uh, I'm new to this particular community, although I've met almost everyone here um, before, but still, I'd like to love to know who you are. And uh, maybe we can start in the back. I, I love your name. And so I wanted to start with you. <laughs> uh, and uh, so am I. How long have you been meditating, Joe? And what brings you here? About four or five years now, and uh, originally I was going to the Shambhala Center, and then I discovered, I learned about this place, and I really liked it, so I I came over here. That's great. Yeah, yeah. good, good. Mm -hmm. And we could just pass the mic around and just tell everybody your name and me. You look familiar. My name is Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I've been a student of the Vyada for, I'd say, 35 years. Uh huh. So um, I've also been involved in this new project that we have here, which is the New York Buddha Dharma. And we're primarily teaching his teachings. And I'm very happy that you're here to be a teacher today. Thank you. Thank you. And it's it funny that you say that. And in case it didn't pick up, it sounded low. She referenced the Vijadra, Chogim Trungpa Rinpoche, and we're studying his material directly. And I have to say, it's intimidating. It's amazing because every time I read Trungpa Rinpoche, just as though 40 years ago when I first read Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, I think Myth of Freedom was actually my first book. So thank you for that, John. And. Um, <coughs> But uh, you know what kind of works in your brain as you're reading it. It's not like just you can space out too much. It's like your mind and body are being transformed by the very material. So I thank you for reminding us why we're here. And uh, hello. Hey, my name is Mike. And um, I've been delving into Buddhism for about 15 years on and off. I started off in Shambhala as well. Um, I recognize you from there. Yeah. And um, I did five levels there, and then I also um, I did a Hinayana path over a year at, Hini at uh, Nalanda Bodhi, mm -hmm. and I've been here for about two years. Wonderful. So you're both Nalanda Bodhi and New York Bodhidharma? Yes. Yeah, so that's great. Intersecting circles. Hello, sir. Hello. So my name is John Baker, and uh, I've been involved with meditation for. 50 years. I'll be dead tomorrow, that's okay. <laughs> and um, I'm a student of Chogyam Trungpa originally and then other teachers after that. And so that's, that's it. Hi, my name is Yen. Uh, I started meditating about four years ago. I started the Shambhala Center and I'm, uh, I'm at the Wan Buddhist Temple. Uh, but I stop, I stop over at the Shambhala Center every so often, and I met you last week, last Tuesday, and then they said you were speaking again today, so I thought I'd come by. Wonderful. Nice to see you, Jan. Nice Thank you. Too. And it was great seeing you Tuesday. Yeah. Very interesting Thank you. What well, I think. Well, what you say, <laughs> My name is Laura, and I've been studying Buddhism for probably 26 years on and off. And I drift in and I come back and, you know, it's the ebb and flow of things. I've studied under Joe, but we're, we go way back. <laughs> and um, I'm glad to be here tonight and I didn't even realize you existed, but what really exists. So, <laughs> I'm <laughs> glad to be here. Yeah, wonderful to see you again. Uh, my name's Nuno. I've I'm been meditating for about three years now and... Um, Nice to see some faces. We were at Three Jewels before. Um, so it's just nice to be here. Hi, Joe. Hi, Nino. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Chris. I've been a <coughs> member of the Shambhala Meditation uh, community for 18 years, a student of Joe's for 10 years. And um, I'm here because this uh, stuff never gets, uh, can't get enough of it, right? It never gets tired, it's a little more bore boring, or uh, it's pretty much endless, right? 
My name is Sarah, and I actually started in 2014 with you, Joe. Um, yeah, you were my first teacher. Aww. And I'm still very lucky to have you as my teacher. My name is Linda. I'm a lifelong Jersey City resident and proud to be one. I'm part of the JC Writers. Um, I work as, I'm happily married to my, to my husband, David, a great guy. I am a government worker by day. I'm receptionist and secretary for a government agency. I'm the first person I, that everyone sees. And I love my job and my life and my family. And I'm a writer. One more thing. Yes. I know you from the Shambhala Center. We've met at the Shambhala Center a couple of times, and a group of us went out to dinner. Uh. Your hair wasn't quite as gray, and I had more. <laughs> I do remember now. Where did we go? Sushi? No. Yeah, it was sushi, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice to see you again, Joe. Yeah. Well, and that's everybody. And Sasha, it's great to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. You look wonderful. How d do you have a picture of you getting older in, the, in your attic? <laughs> was it the attic? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We all have that, yes, yes. Well, I, th I think there is something about a path of meditation that uh, allows us to it, uh, maintain a certain youthfulness, perhaps, that um, we might not have if we attach everything in our world. Because everything in our world is temporary, really, in a lot of ways. And it's, it's a shame, but uh, many people attach to those things like they're real and permanent get an identity with them and then you wake up one day and you've got a different kind of president and different kind of climate <laughs> you know and the world is changing the subways aren't working you know whatever it is and uh it's like we lose who we are for a moment but maybe with meditation and with these teachings particularly the teachings of Chogun Trumper Rinpoche we could uh access something a little more constant not permanent <laughs> there's probably nothing such but just a little deeper within us something that keeps us interested in life if that makes sense i don't think it forestalls aging so don't get any ideas it's not i'm not selling you something that can't can't happen because we we end up you know aging and getting older and breaking down and falling apart in some ways but we can do it in a way that we're gripping and holding on and complaining and unhappy or we could be like that <laughs> and there's a picture of Kempo Tsultram Gamso that I'm showing and he's quite aged in that picture and doesn't show any sign of diminishing his joy and excitement for every moment I've uh had the fortune to experience spending time with him and learning from his teachings and uh oh he's indomitable he's absolutely you know indefatigable if you will and i'm sure as he gets older he's getting more tired and slower and needs to sleep more and do these things I never heard him complain i i uh saw him speak once and he had a mala do you know what that is a string of prayer beads for those of you that might know and the tibetan teachers will use those and he was gesturing gesturing and caught the mala on his table and it broke everywhere and of course some of the people that were promoting the talk or his attendance all were <gasps> and kind of scurrying about and his immediate response i mean immediate there wasn't a gap was just joy like wow this entire thing is just went wrong right and of course there's no wrong if you if you allow things to just wake you up but that kind of nimbleness of mind takes a certain training i think we may be born with it in a way but we lose the ability to access that kind of joy nimbleness and connection to our life over time because our society just simply doesn't support it. In fact, we're kind of trained to be very AD, ADD. 
I almost forgot between the two D's what I was talking about there. So there you go. Or ADD or ADHD or whatever it is. Or when I was a kid, we didn't have those. We just had STPUID. And, uh, you know, pay attention. <laughs> but that's not the method. Just to slap somebody off the head to pay attention. And that kind of creates a certain resistance and a certain doubt in ourselves. The method that we're going to discuss today uh, is called shamatha, the cultivation of peace. It's a meditation technique. And um, it's elucidated beautifully in this book. And we're using this as a, as a basic course text. It's called The Path of Individual Liberation. It's from the Profound Treasury of the Dharma by Chogyam Trump Rinpoche. And this is the white book, they call it, or the foundational teachings. Um, the teachings of Hinayana, or the narrow path, and the kind of thing that all ensuing teachings grow from, and, and the other books, which are different colors, that, you know, talk about the Mahayana path or the Vajrayana path. But it all stems from this. And the cornerstone of any kind of liberation, whether it's personal liberation, which is what we talk about in Hinayana, or whether it's the kind of liberation of all beings of the Mahayana, we're really talking about this idea of learning to work with our mind, right? Allowing the mind to settle and relax enough for us to find it workable. In the chapter that I'm going to pull apart and discuss with you today, he talks a little bit about sometimes there's your mind and you, and sometimes there's you and your mind. <laughs> but they're not always in the same page at the same time. There is the possibility that you could apply yourself to something you might have to do. You, you've got a project going on. You, know, you, you always do, right? But you know, one of your projects with one of your clients or your own comic thing or something, how many times have you sat down to work and your mind just absolutely was not there for you? S significant, right? And I've been me meditating. Yeah, part of the process, I guess. S I imagine it's the same with poetry, right? I remember um, one of my favorite plays is a, I'm also a, a writer, I guess, but the theatrical, it's a little different. I think it's kind of a lower form than poetry, but that's just my own. <laughs> I have such an admiration for poets. Uh, because of that ability to just be present and precise, you know. Um, but uh, one of my favorite plays is called Lemon Sky by Lanford Wilson. It's a uh, autobiographical play. And he actually uh, starts out narrating it. He, he, there's a character playing him narrating his life, but he doesn't get very far because he starts explaining that every time he introduces a character, the character refuses to say what he wants it to say <laughs> and goes off and starts <laughs> his own play, right, or her own play. And indeed, the characters then come out and start doing that. And uh, he's a skillful enough writer that he keeps that cacophony flowing in a narrative. But I think there's something really familiar about that, you know, the sense of who we are, or what we're doing. It's the brain doesn't always cooperate. And we have an intention sometimes, and uh, we're not present there to complete the attention. So the outcome of shamatha practice is that we become nicer, more relaxed, and kind people, I suppose. That's, that's an important component of this. But very specifically, our mind becomes more cooperative. Our relationship to the mind becomes cleaner and more synchronized, so to speak. So I think a lot of people, when they meditate, they have an idea about it. And I think some of those ideas might be a bit aggrandized. And I say that with all respect. I, I still fall into that. These ideas that we're going to become realized or powerful or more attractive. I, I certainly have never lost weight from meditation. Uh, you know, it's a slow way to burn calories and get in shape. And those kind of material and comparative ways of looking at our path are really limited. What we're really trying to do is much simpler, but it's also quite challenging, which is to get to know ourselves. Familiarity, 
is the power associated with meditation that we become familiar with ourselves and are able to work with it so we're not pulling the rug under ourselves sitting down to write and all of a sudden we don't want to write or we're writing a novel instead of a poem <laughs> or whatever it is that we actually can apply our mind to specific things and, and actually get them done with a little resistance because the mind is cooperative it's synchronized, it's unified with our intention, so to speak. Chamata practice is really that. And it is um, a method that's been used for many, many, many years. So I'm just not making this up. Or even Trump Rinpoche didn't make this up because he took this from also the Profound Treasury, right? By Jamin Control. Is it the same name? Yeah, that book. So this is kind of a ancient techniques that Jamun Control then, uh, the great, at the beginning of the 20th century in the, in the 1920s, sort of put together a system, be very, very intelligent guy, that had itself been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? So this all comes from the very teachings of the Buddha in terms of how to sit down. But over the years, it became more codified and more clear. And what we end up with are nine stages of shamatha practice, a very kind of comprehensive view of looking at this practice. So what I'm hoping for today is that we won't just plop down anymore and wonder what's happening, <laughs> that we actually have some idea of what's happening with the practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, usually people's understanding of shamatha or meditation is limited to the instruction given by the, you know, group leader or the instructor. And that's fine. Sit up straight, follow the breath, bring your mind back to the breath. But what does this do and why are we doing it? So I want to suggest that the outcome that we're looking for, possibly, but it seems to have worked for many people over time, is this pliability of mind and this connection between our intention and our actions, that the mind is actually more responsive and more there. And the method is familiarity, that we become more and more familiar with the mind in all its different permutations, so nothing throws us. You might even say we become masters of our own mind to some extent, rather than the other way around rather than being pulled around or dragged around by everything we see, feel, taste, and touch, you know? So <coughs> gaining some sense of control, clarity in our life, I, there's a lot of lists and things, so I brought the book with me to you. And I forgot my glasses, so, oh, here they are. So that's good. There's an example of a failure to employ shamatha, forgetting my glasses. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about as part of the methodology of it is this idea, and it's an important word, resting. So if you, get, if you follow the book, if you read along, chapter 31 begins with the title, Resting in Shamatha. But no words are... Uh, kind of innocuous in this case. Resting itself is very specific and very important. Um, it's a different methodology than holding or grabbing or focusing even, which are very young terms. But it has to do with actually just placing, placing the mind on the present. That itself is an indicator of what's to follow, but also a great methodology in terms of paying attention. Frequently, people that self-identify as ADD or ADHD or SCPUID, uh, you know, simply have too much pressure behind their application. They're trying too hard, right? We're holding ourselves still, or we're keeping ourselves in jobs because we're afraid of the boss, or we somehow have this totalitarian or patriarchal kind of way of top-down holding ourselves in place that's simply not sustainable, it's also not kind. I want to suggest that you could flip that 
and start to think about paying attention to a poem, to a moment, to another person in this way that's much more yin or much more open, much more gentle and relaxed, placing the mind rather than <laughs> right, grabbing the mind. And this relates to something we call mindfulness, right, or trenpa in Tibetan, this sense of holding the mind. But mindfulness implies that we're holding the mind without aggression, without a sense of separation from anything else, without possession or identification, all of which create ego states that make it very hard to stay with the object. So if you're like goal-oriented and you're going to finish that chapter, I think most writers, using that example, know that that's no way to approach the arts, which have to be much more organic and open and fluid. As a coach, I don't think that's the best way to approach your life. And I know a lot of coaches do that. They put your goals up on your, <laughs> up on your wall and remind yourself. And that seems a little like how you treat a child and not an adult who has their own way of looking at things and thinking things. To me, it seems if we could train ourselves to just place the mind where we want it and train the mind to stay there or to work with us, that's the most productive way of getting tasks done and also maybe even opening up to our life in a way that gives us a certain amount of intentionality to it. I don't want to say control, because control sounds controlling, <laughs> but intentionality, where we are actually part and parcel of our life. The mind doing what we feel we want, if you will. It stems from this idea of resting the mind, not grabbing the mind, <laughs> not taking shamatha and the cushion by the, by the neck, right? but just by being here. Yet there seems to be another side of this, which is the yang side, or the side that has more application or assertiveness. But perhaps we overdo that part in our life. And here it's really about the amount of effort required to stay present, not to defeat any enemies or, <laughs> you know, overcome anything, but simply to just humbly be present. Does that make sense? It doesn't really take as much effort as we might think. I like to say, you know, give life your best 60%. But this idea of like 110%, that this Western idea is just not sustainable, of grabbing onto things and holding them and trying to accomplish them, these nine stages of shamatha, which will lead, apparently, to a state of enlightenment, a state of complete, stabilized openness and compassion. But they're not stages that you complete one and then you laud yourself and you complete the other and, and you look at somebody else that's only on level two and you're on level four. It's not like that. It's not competitive. And it's not even consecutive necessarily. So when we go into this, I want you to realize that all of these states are probably states that you've experienced at one time or another in your practice. You haven't stabilized them perhaps, nor have you actually maybe acknowledged them or, or recognized that these are distinct stages in the, in the path. So I want to just check in really quickly and see if I'm making sense. Uh, are there any questions or anything I would need to clarify? Yes, yeah. You're probably the one person that doesn't need a microphone. You've got a great voice. You get, no, no, use it because we're recording. I'm teasing you. But, yeah. I, I understand the state of intention and with mindfulness. Uh, your mind goes, and sometimes that leads to motivation. But it seems to be a very fine line because even when you have that intention with that mindfulness, sometimes you just, oh, let me crack open a beer instead of doing what I'm supposed to do. Right. And, uh, and for more often than not, that's what happens. And unless I, unless I apply a little that grabbing and holding and a little bit of that discipline, mm -hmm. I mean. But I have had states where I said, okay, this is what uh, I want to do. 
and I'll do it. But again, it's a very fine line where it's like, oh, well, it's, just le- it's just easy for me to lie down and take a short nap before I do anything. So how do you, so how, how do yeah. you clear that up and to, to make sure that it goes where you want to go instead of, uh, you know. Just yeah, my, my sense <laughs> is if you, cra- if you, if you want to go to the next thing that you need to do, I'll, I'll get, we'll get you next. But we want to get the mic on you because <laughs> otherwise it doesn't pick up on the recording. But if you crack that beer... I mean, that's not an issue. There's nothing in here that says don't crack a beer. But what it is, is if you crack the beer, has this ever happened? Where you no. crack, where you, wait, let me finish. Where you crack the beer and you don't even know you've done it. Does that make sense? That's not intentional. There's no mindfulness there. The mind just has wandered into another thing. Well, I'll, I'll give you a more recent example. I, I okay. Was, today I was going to come down here mm-hmm. and uh, I know that starts at 6 o'clock. I mean, at 7 o'clock. So I knew that I would have had to leave my house at like uh, at, uh, at 6 o'clock to be here on time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but around 5.30, 5.45, there was this natural urge that, oh, well, who wants to ride the subway? Let me go hop into the bed and take a short nap. But I knew if I would have woke up from that nap, I would have never made it. So something inside, uh, the mindfulness and the, an, in- an intention had to take over. But it required a little bit of that grabbing. Because it's such a very fine line, where said, and many times it has happened. I'll, I'll just fall back into bed and stay there, and and miss out on uh, just miss out on many activities. Sure. So m- m- my guess is, and what we're talking about here is that the more you practice, and and hopefully this will help clarify that practice. That's the point of it. That you get more out of it, and that in time, your mind is more connected right and in a way that you're doing what you want it to do right it doesn't mean that you so right now yeah those kinds of crude methods of I have to push myself I I do I tomorrow I fly out back to Colorado and I'm gonna have to kick my own butt to get myself packed and to the airport right like that but I'm hoping that I'll get to a state where I'm more processed to where those things happen effortlessly. Does that make sense? That resonates a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to use less and less force as we go, but you'll see that during the stages. That's part of what happens during the stages. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. And did you have, did you want to share? Um, we want to give you the mic, though. Is that okay? Sure. Is that, How yeah. Do I don't know. Mm-hmm. Because it helps me to relax. I'm not a naturally relaxed person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very private, but when I meet the MCP, you know, I have uh, easy, easy Asperger's, and it's not, it's never been easy for me to be, to be taking shelter from the um, calm. It's something I've always had to work extra hard at, but I'm hoping sooner or the outgoing. But I need to, like, quiet my mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would ask you or recommend that you be patient with yourself. Patient. That that's what this is about, and very much what he says right at the beginning of the thing. This is about us learning to work with ourselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And you know, you just mentioned two very kind of pretty serious things that many people find debilitating, and and you're very sociable and open and uh, these aren't things I would have recognized in you so you're clearly working right with your things you know and uh, and I think we all have that stuff and I think it's important not to believe that they define us but that right that we can continue to work with ourselves what I'm suggesting here is one of the methodologies is a certain self-respect self-regard and gentleness with ourselves you know Instead of yelling at ourselves and pushing ourselves and creating more tension and anxiety in our life, we could actually learn to just gently (laughs) nudge the mind toward this sense of waking up. Gently, but relentlessly. So there it is. It's not all just being kind and open. It's also being assertive. The yang side of it is that we do apply ourselves and that we do have a structure for this application, you know? Um, 
And so the structure is broken down into these nine stages. The overarching view, at least of the chapter, is called resting in shamatha. And the idea there, it kind of indicates, you know, where we're going with it. Not an idea of like <laughs> holding yourself in shamatha or rising to shamatha, but just resting, just being here. And uh, before I jump into this, I, I do want to say, if you look around the nature, there's uh, some scientists that I love that, because uh, it's kind of a modern way of looking at science, particularly uh, Jenna Levin, who teaches at Barnard and speaks in New York occasionally, I really love her. But one thing she says is, if you really want to understand science, look at nature and just see what's happening. And people don't really do that, you know? And I think it's the same thing about us. Where are we going with this? Some exalted state of superhuman? <laughs> no. We're just trying to be like trees, mountains, streams, clouds, rivers, natural, and present, and here, right? Well, humans, you heard this Tuesday, but humans probably are the only organism on the planet that doesn't like itself, that feels it has to fix itself, you know? Trees naturally grow tall, and they naturally just proclaim themselves. And if they're stopped from that because of the growth of other trees or buildings or anything that truncates their growth, I have a feeling they don't sense a great sense of depression about it. I think they just do the best they can do, if that makes sense, you know? But w we tend to defeat ourselves, and we tend to try too hard or not try hard enough. And it's this bifurcation of our efforts that actually we want to calm down and find what is called generally the middle way on the Buddhist path. The sense of not falling into extremes. And if you're like me in the old days, it would be like, well, this is like a workout thing. Like, just work out like be a gym rat for three weeks and then <coughs> not get back in for three months. And you've seen people do that, right, Joe? I'm pointing to somebody that clearly has mastered that aspect of his life, and uh, and you might could tell I have not. So <laughs> there is that thing. Like we try really hard, and then we flop. Try hard, and then we flop. Trump Rinpoche would say, you know, w w what are we doing? Like somebody asked him once classically, this is a great story, do you ever take a vacation, sir? Because he was kind of relentlessly, effortlessly but effortlessly working, right? Never stressing, never getting freaked out, apparently, that I uh, ever saw or heard about. I mean, perhaps that happened, but I never saw it. And it seemed to be this effortless sense of effort, right, if that makes sense. But he got a lot done, and somebody asked him, do you ever take a vacation? And he said very <laughs> classically, vacation from what? <laughs> what are you taking time off from? Like every time we work like a dog and then we just flop in front of the TV with a beer, you know? It's like that's not an elegant way to develop our life and it's no way to develop the mind really. But the nine stages of shamatha, which I'm going to get into now finally, is, you know, a, a map for, you know, a real sane middle way approach to developing the mind with just enough effort and decreasing amount of effort as we go into these stages to keep ourselves present. But a maximum amount of relaxation, self-regard and kind of self-respect, or the word Trump Rinpoche uses in here, dignity, the sense of dignity of being able to sit up straight and open our heart. So the nine stages are a map that we um, put together, and it's got two essential categories or columns, let's put it this way, because they happen concurrently. There are nine stages and there are six powers associated with those nine stages. So for people who are OCD, that's hopeless and helpless, but the, the, the idea is to relax a little bit into this. Some of the powers sort of work with a number of the stages. I'm going to go through the stages first, although the powers seem to be very important. If you get a hold of the book, and I so recommend it, 
There's a beautiful diagram here with the elephants and the monkey and the meditator, right? And, uh, and it's quite beautiful and it's like a kind of path that goes through the six powers and then the stages occur according, accordingly. And everything, this is so perfectly Tibetan Buddhist really, uh, or which, you know, it's everything drawn on this kind of rather ornate map means something. So don't just pass it over like diagram 7B and sort of give it a cursory look because really looking through this describes so much about the path. The flames that each level has diminish until they're extinguished at the top and they refer to the effort needed. So a lot of effort at the beginning to get yourself to the cushion. But that might be and maybe could be the hardest thing you do. And then when you sit, you're actually beginning this process of resting the mind. Now occasionally the mind will decide it would rather do other things. It doesn't want to rest, it wants to watch Game of Thrones. Okay. When that happens, then we apply a little bit of effort and next chapter and presumably next talk will be on the obstacles and antidotes. And the very first one of those has to do with laziness and bringing yourself back to that inspiration of why you would meditate in the first place. So I want to suggest here, the reason we're doing it is to get to know our mind so that we're not used by our mind, but we're actually in control of our own life and our own effort, as much as we ever can be, you know? So the first of the stages is just called resting the mind. So you sit there. That stage possibly, if you were to look at it in a linear way just to describe it, although these are all interconnected and might happen concurrently or they might have cons happen consecutively, or sometimes you might just rest in one of these. But we delineate things in a kind of a flow chart or a linear flow chart so we can be clear about what we're doing. And generally, frankly, the very first stages are what we're dealing with at the beginning. And the eighth, ninth, and eighth and ninth, seventh, eighth, ninth stages really require a bit of practice. So in some level they are a bit consecutive, right, and linear in that way. Did I just make that completely incomprehensible? <laughs> it's classic uh, kind of Buddhist thought because it's not, it's never as A, B, C, D as we make it. As I go through, you'll get a sense. You've probably had glimpses of the higher levels already. The first is resting the mind, and if we look at it from a linear point of view, it, it, it's a very quick thing. That's what gets us, right, on the cushion. And the power associated with that is the power of learning. We're actually bringing ourselves to the cushion and learning the practice. I like to tell people in meditation instructor, no, as a meditation instructor, I like to tell people that actually at the beginning of your practice, I, I encourage people just to try to refine their posture, you know, for the first few sessions, first week, because that's being present, isn't it? Like seeing how, how well you could sit up and seeing how much you could refine the neck placement and those things, right? Now, obviously, you want to move beyond that, but that sense of learning and understanding the practice and getting into it. Um, as you continue practicing, that sense of the first stage of resting the mind is just the beginning, and that's, and that's like the entryway. Even though we're talking about resting, we're, we're talking about the entryway to deeper stages of that. Does, does that make sense? So the second stage, continuously resting, is we're actually expanding that period out a little longer. So at this stage, we're kind of, maybe this is three to four minutes in to the meditation, that we're actually, we've gone through the speed bump of just sitting down and then, but we're actually trying to encourage the mind toward deepening the process a bit here. So continual resting or a continual placement, which is the application we're using, right? Um, that's the kind of active way of looking at it. Placement is the more uh, yin way of looking at it, a receptive way. P 
replacement is the more active way. Resting is like the result. So in terms of the continuous placement, we're elongating this idea. So you could sit down to rest the mind and to learn how to do it and never progress beyond that. But the next stage is a deepening of that, slight little deepening where we're actually elongating the process and having less application. We're not learning the posture or anything at this point. We're just doing, if, if that makes sense. And the power associated with this is experiencing. So we're really actually not trying to do something now, but we're experiencing what's happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. The next two stages are associated with one, with the third power. And the next two are literally resting and closely resting. And they're associated with a power called um, recollection. And so this is what I was talking about with recollection. It has to do with familiarity. That we're actually remembering how the practice goes. And we're getting deeper in the experience. But now I want to go deeper into the, into the book and talk about these. I think those first are, are pretty self-explanatory. Is that okay? if I move on? Okay. So, <clears throat> literally resting, rather than continuously resting, again, seems to me a, a little less application, right? So, continuously resting, there's still a sense of moving or sort of trying to do something. But with literally resting, I'm going to read you what he says here. This is really actually quite good. If the continuity of your sitting practice is interrupted by thought patterns or by subconscious gossip, you simply bring your mind back. Now, I know that's a pretty given instruction for most people, but this is the stage where you're not trying to meditate anymore, and this happens very naturally. You're remembering the process. You just simply, and that's an important, again, there are no out-of-place words here, simply bring your mind back. In, um, I think, the myth of freedom, probably, uh, meditation in action, that period, he had coined a phrase or an idea, don't entertain the messenger. Is that actually a myth of freedom? That's in, yeah, meditation in action, I think. But the, um, they would talk about that, don't entertain the messenger. So you have this sense of, like, you're sitting, and then you know I'm spacing out, right? And at this stage, we simply come back. No fanfare, no minimal effort, really, at that point. Because truthfully, this is a sidebar from my own experience, it takes less effort to be present than it does to be lost in fantasy. It's just easier to get lost in fantasy because that's what society has trained us to do, or our environment. But the truth of the matter is, it takes less effort to be present than it does to be in this whole war if you will, with your mind of where your fantasies go and, and things that happen um, internally or that kind of thing. So he brings the attention, he brings the uh, analogy of working with children in here as that's something he mentions right from the beginning of the chapter, that what we're trying to do is turn the mind from being adolescent to where it doesn't pay attention and then it grows up a little bit and it's able to pay attention, but it's all over the place. So we have to keep trying to keep it <laughs> in its room, so to speak, to where it's really starting to grow up a bit. And Okay, good. Take care of it. Yeah, where are you gonna next week. Good, good. Thank you. It's so nice to meet you. you okay, bye bye. Yeah. So he's talking a little bit about using the analogy of children, right? And, uh, you know, at first you start this idea of like, take another spoonful, here's a bird flying into your mouth. You know, you, you're kind of trying to trick the child into the practice a little bit. But at this stage, we're actually growing up a little bit and we're remembering for ourselves without a whole lot of, you know, admonition, so don't entertain the messenger, has to do with the idea that you don't have to sit there and go, oh, I shouldn't have gone away, or why did I come back, or how can I keep myself present? You just come back, and you remember what to do, and you remember effortlessly what to do. The question, if you ever have it, of why did I go away, and 
how can I keep my mind from fluttering off, I don't think is a very helpful question. Because if you keep doing the practice, that will happen. But it will only be retarded if you worry about it and beat yourself up around it or create more mental waves, right? So at this stage, we're really talking about just literally resting, not complicating it, not making a big deal of it, just coming back. And the power associated with that, what, what you gain from that is this power of recollection. You're beginning to remember more and more. I think you could say that we're also talking about returning to the natural state, right? Not just returning because we've been bad and we're coming back, but we're actually returning to that natural state of just being present. Closely resting, I'm going to read here, the fourth technique is closely resting. In this technique, you are supposed to deal with the most minute, tiniest possibilities of little flickers of thought. So once you stop struggling, and you stop beating yourself up for going away, and you just simply keep coming back, simply and cleanly. And this is an experience you're all capable of. Just dropping that whole project and coming back, simply and cleanly, what begins to happen is the mind deepens enough, becomes acute enough, that you start to see thoughts as they begin to form. You see the spark that creates the thought, that creates the story, that creates the imprisonment, <laughs> if you will. So you're staying a little closer to the bone and you're actually seeing the beginning of thoughts. And if that feels very advanced or seems very advanced, I could tell you it's not really. Because it, it, it's something we're capable of as long as we are willing to rest the mind in the first place and then continuously rest it and then ultimately literally rest it. And at some point, and just do it without fanfare, at some point, the mind will rest enough, acute enough, that you begin to see the flickers of thought. And it's my experience at this stage, this is pretty exciting. And I promise you, in, in, my, in my experience, but I have a feeling it would be transferable to all of you, that this would be more exciting than any of the fantasies we come up with. And I could come up with some pretty exciting fantasies. I mean, you know, I'm sure you all can, you know? But if some, but you don't have to be honest. You know, <laughs> I'm going to be 60. There's the same old uh, stuff, <laughs> right? It really is. I, I haven't really refined my sexual fantasies in 40 years very much, <laughs> you know? It's still the same old stuff. I haven't refined my power fantasies or my interpersonal vendettas or any of those things. They've stayed pretty much crude and undeveloped. And when I, if I can get past the enticement of that, right? Just get myself past that, really, and be in a deeper sense of meditation, you start to see how the brain works. Not in the storyline or the narrative line, but you start to see the flickers of thought and how they develop or don't develop, where they come from, where they dwell, and where they go, they say in the Mahamudra teachings. Right, Very exciting if you can be on that level. And again, these things don't necessarily happen concurrently. My experience is I could get glimpses of that and it's so much more rewarding than the same old power fantasies. But then it goes away and then I'm back to those things, right? <laughs> and it's like, how did I get back here? So you go back to the stage that's you know, appropriate. That's come back and don't make a big deal of it. Just be back. Be back when you're back and build the power of recollection. So you're remembering more and more. And during this point, the next stage, which I think is, a, is there's a line here. I feel this is my interpretation, but I feel like there's a line. The next um, stage of shamatha is called taming the mind. And in taming the mind, we're actually also taming our world, if that makes sense. So it's not just the practice at this point, and that's what I mean that there's a line here. We start to see results in the world at this point. Like everything begins to settle down. In that, in that pic picture, that, that uh, diagram, the, uh, the elephant that is our brain uh, is now laying down, you know? 
and everything is sort of calm and connected in our mind. I think you probably do understand the relationship between internally our brain and externally the world. Is, is that something everybody's experienced? When you're in a bad mood, people tend to treat you badly. <laughs> surprise, surprise, funny how that happens. When you're angry, we tend to get more anger back from our environment. And those passion, aggression, and ignorance are very crude level ways that we exit because of stress and tension within us and kind of go into these little worlds that we create, these realms, if you will, uh, that we create. And the, uh, instead of taking those exit strategies at this stage, we've tamed the mind enough to just be with those little subtle blips in the brain and not go there so much. And then somehow the world doesn't respond in that way. We're calm and open, and the world is more calm and open. It doesn't mean there's a change in the administration <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> the cartels give up their drugs. or There's nothing particularly practical in the environment that may or may not happen, but our relationship to it is now calm, is now relaxed. And the environment, hence, the administration or the cartels or whatever it is, the global warming, is is in still there, maybe it's stuff we can address, but it's not affecting our personal sense of stability. Th does that make sense? We actually have this connectivity with our environment where instead of antagonizing the environment, we're calming the environment. I actually had a friend that literally said, he was talking about when you're a younger student or something, he goes, remember back, <laughs> he's, he's real gruff, and, uh, and he goes, remember back when you thought everything was attacking you? <laughs> like the world was always attacking you. <laughs> you, know, you walk out the door and everything's coming at you. And he's t he was talking about aging. And then like, as you get older, you start to realize it maybe isn't that. But this is, I think, more profound and more personal. This is a sense that everything isn't attacking you. <laughs> that actually things are as they are. And that's OK. And our ability to see that and work with that becomes enhanced the less we're agitating it or agitating the process. The next uh, stage is called um, thoroughly pacifying, which is like continually resting. It's just extending that out. So rather than a glimpse, this becomes actually a state that's, that's, that's um, more extended. But what he says about this that I have uh, highlighted Whatever the heat, whenever the heat of aggression comes up, you put more emphasis on the outgoing breath, on the simplicity and windy, airy quality of your breath. Now, do you see the pattern here? Like, we, we're disengaging from antagonizing our world and having our world then antagonize back to where we've sort of stopped that process, so we've resting enough that the world doesn't have to attack us any longer. And here he's actually saying you could go further and actually it begins to change the meditation itself into this much lighter, more open and more breath oriented rather than form oriented meditation. That we're actually changing our allegiance towards space rather than form. So this is further s shifting into something else instead of I have to come back to the breath. Now we're actually just coming back to the sense of space and, and a less corporeal relationship with things. One pointedness is the next stage and pretty much the outcome of that. And this is the eighth stage. So for those of you that this is just too long at this point, we're almost there. And, uh, <laughs> but if you're feeling that way, clearly you're not at this stage. <laughs> and one point in this is, uh, is and then and I'm not either. So, uh, but one point in this, like thoroughly pacifying, is connected with the power of exertion. And here are the powers. But here's an irony, because exertion is what we needed to apply more at the beginning. But now they're talking about this as exertion, as the power. But you see, it's something we're receiving. It's like we're, we are exertion. We're not trying anymore, right? The very thing is exertive, if you will, 
right? That's not really a word, I don't think, but I, I defer to the poet. But uh, <clears throat> is connected with the power of exertion. With one pointedness, you can discipline yourself, but at the same time, you begin to feel that your discipline is not too effortful. You can allow yourself a certain relaxation and freedom in bringing your mind back to the breath. And the reason it's called one-pointedness, which sounds like a reductive thing, it sounds like everything is here in this one point, it means that every point is the same point. Right? So at some point, you come back to the present, and you can pay attention to anything. And if it's the breath in meditation, that's great. If it's the road when you're driving, that's great. If it's your poetry, you're really present, right? That the mind just naturally begins to rest and that on a point or any point that you place it. That, does that make sense? There's an associated term which is associated with much more advanced practices and more in the Vajrayana sense, but I think this is very close to what gets called one taste, where the world has lots of different flavors, but they're all of equal value. And wherever you put your mind is the present and, and where it needs to be. Does that make sense? That we stop going, oh, this is better than that. Or I can't be here because I should be there. Or look at my friends, they're here. Look at Joe, he's got a great body and he's my same age. Let's BS, because he has a great body, and I have a great body. You know why my body's great? Because it's here. <laughs> it's where I am. Does that make sense? And that's what's important, that we could rest where we are. You know, that we, could, that we could be where we are. And finally, the final stage is resting evenly. And I'm going to read right from the book. At this stage, the mind is completely and thoroughly trained so that it could hang out in its own form. This doesn't mean that you are blissed out. It simply means that your mind can be your mind. In other words, you can be you in the present, in the purest sense, as well as the present sense. It was a good Freudian thing, yeah? You could be you in the purest sense, without all the accoutrements, without all the dependent, attendant things that you think you need, you know? You could just be you and be simple. Right. Up to this point, you have never been, well, this is, so, this is edited well because it sounds like him. Up to this point, you have never really been yourself at all because you have always been too involved in your own little tricks. I, kinda did that, I overdid that last part. Finally, you could be yourself. When you sit down on your meditation cushion, take your posture and begin to follow your breath, you could be right there. That is the idea of resting evenly or absorption. And I'm going to add or samadhi. Now you've heard those terms. And sometimes absorption and samadhi are used identically to just mean meditation. But they're also states of meditation to where you're in it so fully and completely that nothing is going to shake you out until you determine to go or someone rings the gong or something, right? There's no fighting this at this point. The, pow the power associated with this is the power of familiarity. Resting evenly is connected with the sixth power, the power of familiarity. So recollection sounds more active. Remember a couple of powers ago or power before last that we're actually trying to remember a little bit, there's a little effort there. This is just familiarity, this is, we just know it. We know this, we're not trying it, we're not doing anything. But the interesting thing is, this is not just the path to learn the practice of shamatha. You understand that, right? Because at this stage, y your mind is transformed. In order to do this, unlike learning Pilates or, or learning anything else, really. It's separate from you. You're learning something. You're learning a form. You're learning a dance, right? Or you're learning, you know, how to work out certain stanzas in poetry or something like that. You're applying a mental thing.
But with this, you're actually training your mind to become the thing, you know? So during this process, at the beginning, it's more separate. You're learning shamatha, and you're trying to do it, and you're reporting back to your teacher how it's going. But at some point, it just becomes so natural. You've morphed into the shamatha. You've become it, and it has now become you, you know? And that's the view. Like I said, it we come in and out of these states until we stabilize them. But you may have had, I have had glimpses of being in this completely even place where there's no effort and yet I seem to be awake. My experience is that that lasts so quickly because I notice it <laughs> and then I think it's good <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm back, you know, I'm back at the beginning, you know, if you will, if that makes sense, right? You kind of look down. And you kind of look down. You're on the tightrope and you look down, right? And you get you kind of wobbly. So we're very close to time, but I think we uh, can take a question or two if you... Is that okay, John, if we, we go over a little bit and, and take questions? Um, so what I'd like to do is have somebody offer a question. Yes. Uh, I, what I'd like, I would love if we just have a little interaction. So, because I'm not sure if I covered everything, so if we can clarify a few points. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So, uh, it's something I got from your presentation mm -hmm. of the material. Um, it seems to, if, if I get, you know, I just want to make sure I got, understand this right. Either. Each of the steps or phases also seem to me, in my own uh, practice, like they're all, each in and of themselves are sort of like a step. Like back to the present moment, mm -hmm. right? Wherever you are in that right uh, process. Cause like you, I, I think that's my issue that I work with a lot is my mind goes off all the time. It doesn't stay in the present. I have the you know the experience of being in the present moment, and I feel like I'm right there on the spot. Uh, feels really good, but then of course, like you say, something comes up, and the mind goes off. <laughs> more often than not um, and for what you were saying my impression is like at each of those phases you can right uh, kind of intersect yourself right and come back to the present moment what does that mean intersect yourself uh, yeah, I'm uh, sorry I'm sorry maybe using the wrong yeah, word um, yeah like stop myself right that process of well, Continuing yeah, I guess, I guess that, that's part of the practice right from the beginning, right? Yeah. That you kind of establish what... The, the, the reason we get into a good posture at the beginning, by the way, is that we're taking the, the body and the energy of the body out of the equation so that the mind can rest in a more pure state, right? So if you're like this, you're telling your mind something. So you're coming from that point of view, right? If you're like this, you know, whatever it is, you're prejudicing the experience. But if you're in a neutral state, which is what the idea is, to just be to where there's less discordance between the body and the mind, the mind can rest a little bit, relax a little bit, and just f clarify itself, right? That makes sense. But right from the beginning, the next stage of the process after setting that is to bring ourselves back to the present. And I didn't say this, but I think this is really good to point out. The process of coming back to the present in me most meditation is the object of meditation. That's what we call it. And in shamatha, what we're trying to do is create an ultimate union with that. So we're not coming back to the breath. We are the breath, right? But you could use a candle or a picture or a phrase or a mantra. In some cases, people use mantra. I, it's my experience uh, if you want to run off and do mantra or whatever, that the mantra isn't as effective as the breath for actually bringing you clearly to the present. Because in the mantra you can kind of go back and forth. And, and I think that's kind of the point of mantra, but that's another discussion. There is no object of meditation in my mind. But my mind is limited. I, I don't have the most, yeah, and, you know, you could defer to John or Kempo you know, people that have even more experience. But for me, the breath is the, it is the exemplary object because you're actually 
reliably in the present. You're not thinking about it, right? Or maybe you're in the present. That breath is in the present. Every breath is one less breath you'll ever take, right? It's like, you know, unqualifiably present. But it also is happening in the body. So as you're aware of it, you're calming the body even more and taking the body out of the equation so that the mind could further clarify. So at the beginning of the stages, you're yanking yourself back to the breath, maybe. <laughs> right? And, uh, and then you're extending that out a little bit. But as you continue along, it becomes more and more subtle. And I think in the last three stages, you're not really bringing yourself back anymore. They're just different stages of being present. You're there. You're there, yeah. Yeah, and, and deepening that, that experience of there. Yeah. Hey, Joe, thank you so much sure, for your man. talk. It was, nice to uh, see you. Very, very helpful, yeah. yeah. Um, as John can attest, this idea of not, not too tight, not too loose has always been something that's uh, come up for me. And um, while, like, uh, and I, it confounds me sometimes how many uh, lists and sublists that there can be in Buddhism, they can be also, uh, you know, like, super helpful, like, whether it's 12 Nidanas or this uh, talk, sometimes it kind of, like, feels like it's slowing things down, like in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's helpful because there's a part of me that just feels like, oh, just keep coming back to the cushion, keep coming back to the breath, and keep doing it, and things will clarify. But at the same time, I definitely catch myself where I'm just entertaining myself for half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that there is an effort there beyond just getting to the cushion. And so that can be slippery for me sometimes. So having these talks helps. Mm -hmm. So thanks. And then I want to underscore that idea of effortless effort, which is, a, which is an end game, right? So, but the, this idea of diminishing effort, so it becomes more and more subtle. Does that make sense? is part of this process. So at the beginning, it, it, whatever it takes, you know, that gets you there, okay? But then it, it, it's kind of brittle because if you're forcing yourself, you, you're gonna wanna run away even more. So if at some point it shifts and there's something compelling about being on that cushion, right? And, I, and for me, and it'll be different for everybody, but for me it's when you start to see the very subtle rising of thoughts in the mind that's fascinating to me you know because it just kind of opens you up to something or you really start to feel like you're glimpsing behind the curtain you know in the wizard of oz or beginning to see the operating system you know and that's actually pretty cool you know and it's at once like i said it's happening to you as it's or he says you know you and your mind start to become one thing rather than separate things but the uh you know, when you actually see the operating system, it takes a certain calm to get there, right? But it's also calming to do that, if, if that makes sense. So if you can get yourself to the point where there's enough stability to really begin to open the possibilities of the mind, rather than just working with the habitual part of it. Does, does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So maybe you can kind of make an analogy between the creative mind that feels that fluttering, those moments mm -hmm. when you're writing or doing your art artwork, you feel your mind as one, right, with your body. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess it's trying to um, mirror that somehow within your meditation. So maybe where is that bridge? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. You find it here in creativity and then you look for it in your meditation, and are they the same, or are they different, or yeah, I think am I crazy? No. <laughs> at, at the beginning, they're all different, right? right. It's the, the, the very general course of the process. And as we go, they come together so that they become all the same. I, I, I want to just kind of offer a little story. It doesn't completely answer your question, but that question needs more discussion, and we can do that but it's hot and tired and late now. But I wanted to offer something because I mean, it was inspired by the writers here and you're also a writer and Chris is a writer and 
John, and imagine some of you must be too, and I am, I think. I, I, um, I'm working on a book. I'm very excited. I have all the words. I just need to arrange them in order, you know, into sentences and stuff. But I, I have, no, I'm kidding. That's my joke, my favorite joke. But the story is Allen Ginsberg, the de facto poet laureate of his generation, I guess, and uh, exalted figure, was a student of Trump and Bechet's and would write <laughs> poetry during meditation sessions. And then I guess until, the, you know, the Vijayadar actually led the session and saw that and called him out on it. And Alan, when he told the story, I, I heard Alan tell the story um, at Naropa, and uh, he actually told the story and he said he... Uh, was explaining that uh, the meditation gave him this clarity, especially when the Vijara was present, to have this amazing ability to write these fantastic lines. And the Vijara said, that's not very good meditation. <laughs> so maybe it was a good way to write poetry, but it wasn't a good way to meditate. What he said was, and I think he said the Vijara had told him this too, but what he found out was if he had the power to just let those things go, that his mind settled even further and his poetry got even better. Th does that make sense? Like the lines that he was letting go of became less the point and more the clarity of his mind. And it led him to this kind of poetry that he did kind of later in his life where it was less verbose and less imagistic and more about what he saw in the present moment, you know, and I don't know how poets look at that, if that they think that's better or not as good, but I found some of it fascinating because he would read some of that in Europa. And, and I thought of it, it's a great technique for writers to maybe just write what they see like a still life, like a painter would, right? Just take a moment and just try to describe a, a table, you know, or a microphone or what's actually there without imposing a lot of stuff. And, clarifying that view, you know, and, uh, or something like that. But I, I, I thought it was amazing that somebody who was this substantial figure, and I think a little overwordy and indulgent of a writer <laughs> myself, <laughs> it's just uh, complicated for me, but, but that he was willing to let that go and go into a whole other thing of more direct contact, if, if that makes sense. And he said he was more synchronized in his mind and his writing then was more synchronized. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. Further simplification, further synchronicity, further connection to the present. I just feel slightly young. And, and let's go quickly, because that watermelon's calling me. That's very, very short questions. I feel slightly guilty about my meditation practice for the simple reason when I'm coming back to the breath, sometimes I'll have a very pleasant thought in my mind, you know, a nice dinner or whatever, or a nice family gathering, and I'll say, I'll come back to the breath right after I finish this thought, and I'll come back to the breath. That's, I feel slightly guilty about that. And uh, the, the other thing is, I hear about people, they have moved, moving meditation, they have meditation, just right now, writing, they, they, they write their poetry. So now I say, well, I might as well be super comfortable because I tend to have a cup of coffee while I'm meditating. And, uh, uh, so I don't see anything wrong with that. But I'm sure if I told the people that I meditate, what they would say, oh, that's not a good way to meditate. So I feel slightly guilty about that. Those two things are way on my mind every so often about my meditation practice. Yeah. Well, uh, guilt is associated with a different tradition than Buddhism. Okay. You know, well, uh, uh, other, many other traditions, but we, we, we try to, well, I could argue about Catholicism, but it's, anyway, I think what we're trying to do is find ways to motivate ourselves. John is better at answering this, I think, because he's your more current thing. But, it, you know, if, if a cup of coffee, I, it, I had a weight trainer that told me, I was like, I keep drinking coffee to get into the gym, but I think it's creating more stress. He goes, if it gets you into the gym, it's good, <laughs> right? So, you know, if, if that's what you do to get to the cushion, but this is a map of how you could refine that. At some point, if you could do 10 minutes without drinking the coffee, just extending more and more time, and if you see a value in that, then that will motivate you naturally and much better than guilt or 
feeling badly about things. And don't worry about what other people do. And the don't other, don't and, worry about that. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, where I have a pleasant thought, and before I come back to the breath, I say, oh, let me complete this thought before I come back to the breath. Yeah. And uh, I, I feel... Uh, How long does that take? Three seconds, because I always come back to the breath, but I feel lousy because I let that die in my thought. I'd give, my I'd give myself three seconds. It's okay. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. I, I do that too, and I want to finish it. But I'll guarantee you, if you don't come back to the breath, and this is another conversation we have to end now, but that thought will degrade, and it won't stay pleasant. It's just the nature of mind, because, you know, to eventually go into paranoia or competition or any of the ego states if we don't catch it. Does that, okay. does that make sense? Sure, sure. So I would say, yeah, three seconds to finish your thought, okay, but if you go longer than that, you're going to find that you're just creating more ang anxiousness in the practice, okay? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are we reading this? Yeah. Joe. Okay, yeah. I want to thank you very much. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you very much, and Just, I neglected yeah. to introduce you at the beginning of the talk. Joe is a Long-time practitioner. I first heard him teach at Shambhala Mountain Center. I was walking down a path and there he was with a group of students um, sitting on the ground. They were all in a big circle and I sat down and I thought this is an extraordinary teacher. I'm going to be knowing him more as time goes on. So we thank you very much for coming um, and for your wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you. Very helpful. Thank you. And hearing you say that, it must be like a, a high school trumpeter hearing Miles Davis say <laughs> they, they liked you the way you did the anthem. I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. And this isn't just to trade compliments, but I really want to encourage people to continue this little beautiful thing you have going here, right, with New York Bodhidharma. This is going to be a wonderful alternative and a good, you know, method for people to wake up. So here's the um, dedication of merit. Does everybody know it? Or, I mean, not by heart, but you know what it is, right? We're saying anything, any goodness that we attained from here, we're, um, we're dedicating for the benefit of all beings, not keeping it just for ourselves. Hmm. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the waves of birth, old age, sickness and death, from the ocean of sorrow, may I free all being by the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom, may the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled, may all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you.